have a very exciting topic that we'd like to discuss today. Actually, it's one of our favorite subjects. But before we do that, I have one question that I'd like to ask. Something that Jesus said, uh, Peter, in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, he says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? How, how do you interpret that verse? There's a, a real difference between Jesus' laws, his commandments, which lead to a place in the kingdom, to, have a, a, uh, to be successful in his kingdom, and the way, the, the laws of the world with, without God. That, that, that's how I see it, that he's making that distinction there. If somebody came to you and said, uh, Peter, from now on, from this day forward, you can only drink one beverage, and you had to choose a beverage, and you knew that that's the only beverage you were going to drink, what would you choose? Could it be in my, the Bible for you mug? You can drink it in any mug you want. Well, it'd have to be water. It'd have to be water. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody else came to you and said, from now to the end of your life on this earth, you can only read one book, only one. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of books in the world today. What book would you choose? I mean, I don't read that many books uh, other than the Bible, so that's a pretty easy one. I would keep on reading my Bible. <laughs> Good answer. What book would you choose if you could only choose one book and read it for the rest of your life? Hopefully, it would be this one. The B-I-B-L-E. Now, I have a question for you, if you yes, don't mind. Yes, I don't um, mind. There's a lot of uh, uh, different editions of the Bible. So if you had to pick one for your single book, what would that be? Peter, I was waiting for you to ask me that question because that is the topic of our discussion today. There are so many translations of this book, how do you know which one to read? In fact, there are almost 900 English translations mm. and paraphrases of the Bible, and how do we know which one is better than the other? If you could only choose one, or which version of the Bible should we be reading? Should we be yeah. studying? Yeah. And I think uh, it's clear to say, if you read different translations of the Bible, the same passage in different translations, that not all Bibles are created equal. Uh, I think the favorite version of the Bible that I grew up on as a Christian, uh, not as a child, but as an adult, is the King James Version of the Bible. I have to ask you this question, Peter. Mm. If you were to go see a Shakespearean play, like Romeo and Juliet, uh, or one of the other famous Shakespearean plays, would you want to see it in the language that it was written, or would you rather see an updated version of Romeo and Juliet put into modern American English or modern day English? Ah, oh, that depends. I mean, uh, uh, that's a tough one. To you know, there, there, there's, there's advantages to both, I think, no? Yeah, well, it, you know, take a phrase like to be or not to be, that is the question. Mm -hmm. Whether it is nobler of the mind to, how would you put that in modern day English? I don't know. <laughs> I know. So, some, uh, so if we take some of the words in the King James Version of the Bible, somebody asked me once, uh, why do you read the King James Version? And I went to my pastor and I said, why, why do we read the King James Version of the Bible? And he said, because it's the best one. Hmm. And so I went back to that person and I said, we read the King James Version of the Bible because it's the best one. No, at the and, time and, the King... And, and that didn't really, when I thought about it, oh, does that really make sense? How do I know it's the best one? Well, yeah. Well, now, now, at the time the King James was published, um, that there were, of course, people who um, did not like it because it was a bit too modernized. You know, they preferred some of their older English translations. Right, so, like the Geneva Bible or the Great Bible. The Great Bible, yes. the Bishop, yeah, back, back to, um, right. you know, they, they went back a ways, you know. Right. Uh, so, so uh, would, would you say that, you know, from where we are now, is, is the King James kind of our, um, our standard original English Bible to look to? Okay, well, let's take a look at several different versions of the Bible, and we'll take a few verses and we'll read them in each of those versions. We'll start with the King James Version of the Bible. It's an English translation of the Christian Bible for the Church of England, which was commissioned in 1604 and published in 1611. The books of the King James Version include 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. 
and most people don't realize that there was an intermediate section of the Bible that the, the original King James included, which were the 14 books of the Apocrypha. And it's the, the King James Version of the Bible has been renowned as one of the great works of the English language. Yeah, it, it certainly set the standard for modern English. So let's look at what three verses sound like in the King James Version of the Bible. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So some people might have a problem understanding whoso believeth in him. That's not the way we talk today, but it's pretty understandable. Sure. It's not a big stretch. Sure. John 3.36 in the King James Version of the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And then Mark 16.15, which is also a very well-known verse, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. So let's take a look at these three verses in the New King James Version, if you'd like to read, uh, read them to us and compare them to the King James Version. Okay, so here we are with the New King James Version, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So okay, they so they're the, the who updating so, the verbs, yes. updating the verbs into um, the way we speak. Means the same nowadays. thing, though, seems to. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's look at... Verse 36, same uh, John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I just want a little side note on that. That's John the Baptist speaking. He tells us so much of what we know about Jesus in, in those verses there. Just shout out to John the Baptist there. Um, Mark sixteen fifteen in the New King James. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so they mean pretty much the same thing. They've just updated the verbiage, which yeah. makes it a little mm -hmm. easier to understand. Um, yeah, and the New King James Version is an English translation of the Bible. The complete new uh, King James uh, Version of the Bible was published in 1982, not that long ago, by Thomas Nelson. The New King James Version of the Bible is described by Thomas Nelson as being completely faithful to the original, yet truly updated to enhance its clarity and readability. So, a lot of people read the New King James Version of the Bible, and I personally don't have any trouble doing that. Sometimes I miss, because I grew up as a young adult on the King James, I miss the Old English mm. in there. Just as, how do you say, uh, going back to Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question. So there's uh, another very popular translation. Uh, this is a modern one that we, we've used on our channel even, the English Standard Version. Uh, it's um, published in 2001 by Crossway. And they used, uh, it was a team of 100 scholars and pastors. The ESV, English Standard Version, relies on recently published critical editions of the original Hebrew and Greek texts. Crossway, the publisher, claims that the ESV continues a legacy of precision and faithfulness in English translation of the original text. They describe the ESV as a translation that emphasizes word-for-word -word accuracy, literary excellence, and depth of meaning. So what I like about that is the ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible, <clears throat> goes back to the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and relies more on those original transcripts, possibly even than the King James Version. So very similar, but very interesting that they put a lot of emphasis on the original transcripts. Now, as it says here, they, are, they rely on recently published critical editions of the original Hebrew and Greek texts. The King James translators and actually uh, pretty much all of the early Reformation translators they were also using Hebrew and Greek manuscripts. So uh, there is a question of which Hebrew and Greek manuscripts are the correct ones. For the ESV, they're using uh, supposedly some very, very good ones. So some of the differences between 
a translation like the ESV or the NIV and the King James does come from the differences in the manuscripts and that are used. And how do these three verses that we have chosen, uh, John 3.16, 3.36, and Mark 16.15, read in the English Standard Version? Okay, here, here we go. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So they just dropped the word begotten, seems mm -hmm. like. But, mm -hmm. um, John 3.36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now that, that's an interesting one. I've seen that in some newer translations where belief and obey sometimes gets used interchangeably. And um, if that is correct, then it does help to shed light on a number of important and verses. And in fact, some of these translations, if you're doing a Bible study for and you're going to present something that you study in the Bible to friends or if you're a pastor of a church, uh, it's nice to check out the different mm -hmm. translations. You might add more meaning to the scripture that you're reading by going through some of the different translations and sure. pull a little more out of sure. it. Unless you read Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic and you're a linguistic uh, professor or scholar and you can go to the original and make the translation yourself. However, even if you do that, you have to remember those translations had like 100 people, you know, or 70 people, d depending on the translation, working together and kind of, uh, so they might have done a better job than even if you did it all by yourself. Sure, I th that, that's an important uh, detail there. There are translations that were the work of one person, and there are, and there are translations that were the work of a team. Um, I have a little more confidence when they're done by a larger group. Yeah, so before you go out and just buy a Bible, a translation that you know nothing about, it would be good to do a little research and find out how did that translation or how did that paraphrase of the Bible come into being. All right, we have one more verse here. We'll read Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. All right. So the English Standard good. Version. Sure, yeah. Okay. The American Standard Version of the Bible. The American Standard Version, which is also known as the American Revision of 1901, is rooted in the work that began in 1870 to revise the King James Bible of 1611. So again, this was an attempt to kind of upgrade the language. The English language was evolving and they wanted to put the Bible out in, in, a, in a format that was more easily understandable for the common man. So uh, what's the difference between the King James Version and the American Standard of the, uh, Bible? Well, John 3.16 in the American Standard Version says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Almost the same. John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And Mark 16, 15, this is again the American Standard Version, says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to the whole creation. So not a whole lot of difference uh, in the American Standard Version. I guess it made a big difference back in the day. Mm. Uh, now we're going to get into some of these very interesting translations or paraphrases of the Bible. And uh, the first one we're going to talk about here is that Peter's going to introduce us to is the message. Okay, we're going to read a little bit about the message translation. This is a fairly popular one, I think, that uh, I know people use it. The message, the Bible in contemporary language, is a tr version of the Bible by Eugene H. Peterson, published in segments between 1993 and 2002. According to the introduction to the New Testament in the message, its, quote, contemporary idiom keeps the language of the message, which is the Bible, current and fresh and understandable. Peterson, the translator, notes that in the course of the project, he realized that this was exactly what he had been doing in his 35 years as a pastor. So a, a pastor explained the Bible to people he wanted to uh, do his own version of it, publishes his paraphrase of it, always looking for an English way to make the biblical text relevant to the conditions of the people. Okay, so we're going to have some fun with this one right now, and we're going to read a few passages that are very well known. This is from Psalm chapter 23, The Lord is my shepherd. Everybody okay. knows that one. 
This is the new international version. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now compare that to the King James Version, which you're probably more aware of. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, the, the, yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So Peter's going to give us the next two. The next one, very interesting, it's from the Living Bible. Okay. The Living Bible. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Wow. He lets me rest in the meadow grass and leads me beside the quiet streams. He gives me new strength. He helps me do what honors him the most. Even when walking through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. Now, even though that is very different from the, uh, from the King James Version, there are parts of the Living Bible Translation that I enjoy reading, and I think sometimes they give, uh, they give depth to uh, what, what the passage is actually saying. Although I love it more with the King James Version of that passage, I do enjoy reading some of the other takes on it. Okay, uh, let's take a look now from the message translation or paraphrase of the Bible. This is the one that you had just explained where how it was given. The pastor realized this is how he's been mm. preaching to his congregation. And now we have a written version of that in his paraphrase of the Bible called the message translation or the message Bible, I think they call it. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. What, what passage is this again we're reading from? I, I forgot. <laughs> Psalm 23. No, no in, in, in the Living Bible, I could uh, recognize what's right. being said there. This one's a little different. <laughs> this one's pretty different. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, now, there is a Death Valley That's in a, California, but I think it's talking about the Valley of the Shadow of Death, that Psalm 23. I am not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. So what did we think about the message uh, version of that Psalm 23? It, it sounds like he's talking, you know, something that would uh, be appealing to a very unique set of people. I guess like people like himself and people who he talks to, like this is something that works for them. As a wider translation, I don't care for it because uh, I want something that uh, is going to translate the original words to everybody in the um, most careful, precise way possible. Now, I think it's important to bring out at this point here, and that is if we decide to do a new translation of the Bible and we say base our work on the King James Version, as long as we make as long as we change it up at least 10% from the original, we can then copyright our work and mm. we can sell it for the next 100 years and make profit from our translation. Is that what some of these translations are trying to do? I hope not. Well, there are, there are big publishers that uh, frequently come up with new uh, translations or new revisions of a translation. And, and you know, so to be sure, yes, there could be a profit motive for some of these. Right. Uh, I, I would like to think that um, in most cases, no, of course. Okay, we have some other uh, comparisons here that we'd like to do. Let's take Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, which is the Lord's Prayer, which we are all uh, pretty familiar with. This is the new international version, version of the Lord's Prayer. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts and as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. So that's the, 
that was the New International Version. Here's the King James Version of the Lord's Prayer. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And before we move out of that, Peter's going to read two other versions of the Lord's Prayer. The first one from the Living Bible. All right. Pray along these lines. Our Father in heaven, we honor your holy name. We ask that your kingdom will come now. May your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Give us our food again today as usual. And forgive us our sins just as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Don't bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. That's not bad. No, it's That's okay. Not, not, yeah, not bad. Sure. And then we have the... Uh, now here's the, the, the message. The message. This is the, the Lord's Prayer from the Message Translation of the Bible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, by Pastor Eugene. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You are in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well. I like it, but yeah. I, I don't uh, consider that to be on the same level as the Lord's Prayer. It might ring a, it might have, it might ring a bell. It's What's a nice prayer. To say? Yes. It's a nice prayer, but it's not uh, right. quite the way Jesus um, to us. There's one more that we could go on and on here, and we could, uh, there, since there are so many different translations of the Bible, there's the Douay translation of the Bible, which is... That's a pretty good one. Right, which is predominantly used in the Catholic Church. Used uh, to be. Used to be, and there's an updated version of the well, Bible in the Catholic Church. Well, so the, the Douay Rheims was published um, about 30 years before the King James, and that was the authorized Catholic English translation. And uh, they used that, like the King James, for several hundred years until... Recently, now, now there's um, uh, the Jerusalem Bible, I think, might be the most used uh, Catholic English translation. But there's still people who, um, you know, kind of like we like the King James. There are people who say, nope, Dewey Rames is good enough for me, and they stick with that. One more interesting point about Dewey Rames is that uh, it's very likely to have had an influence on the King James, because that was a very up-to-date English translation that was... Uh, in print as they were working on the King James. And a lot of uh, scholars say that these different uh, elements of the New Testament uh, were helped by that translation. Uh, another interesting point about the older translations that, uh, that we need to remember, and that is um, for the first 1400 years that the, after the Bible was compiled, all of the Bibles in existence were handwritten copies. There was no printing press. So you can imagine how rare it was to have a complete Bible, yeah. all handwritten. And That's we right. are very spoiled now with the printing presses. And boy, yeah. you go on Amazon today and just order a Bible just sure. like that. So there's one more translation we just want to touch upon here, which we think is interesting. And, and that is the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation, Book of Isaiah and the New Testament with Psalms, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon is translated from the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic texts by Dr. Brian Simmons. Hi, I'm Brian Simmons. I'm the lead translator for the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation is an attempt to bring God's fiery heart of love and truth to this generation using Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew manuscripts, merging all of those together with the emotion and the truth of God's Word and accuracy coming forth. I think you'll enjoy reading the Passion Translation. Simmons is known as a passionate lover of God. After he was dramatically converted to Christianity, to Christ, Brian knew that God was calling him to go and reach a part of the world that he felt needed the gospel. And he took his wife, Candace, and their three children. He spent nearly eight years uh, in, the, in the tropical rainforest of the Darren province of Panama as a church planter translator and consultant. 
The purpose of the Passion Translation by Simmons is to reintroduce the passion and fire of the Bible to the English reader. It doesn't merely convey the literal meaning of words, so it's interesting that it expresses God's passion for people and his world by translating the original life-changing message of God's word for modern readers. So here are a few verses from the Passion Bible uh, in this translation. So Peter, we'd like, if you wouldn't mind reading a couple passages from the Passion Bible, which we have chosen here. This is John 7, verses 37 and 38. All you thirsty ones, come to me, come to me and drink. Believe in me, so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just like the scripture says. What do you think of that? Well, I think it's refreshing. Um, I don't, the Passion Bible is another interesting translation. It's sometimes nice to kind of cross-reference it and see how uh, Simmons translated it. I know that the Passion Bible really is one of the favorites of my wife, but it still doesn't quite make it to the top of the list because on the top of our mm. list, our personal list, is the King James Version of the Bible uh, with the English Standard Version coming a close second. Uh, that's just for me personally. What what are your favorites if you had to list your top favorite translations of the Bible? Well, we, I usually read King James. Uh, I, do, I do like the uh, New International Version. A point about that that's that's interesting is that it's an ongoing project. You know, the 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 team that does it r meets regularly and uh, and discusses points, and and so it's it's a, a very serious ongoing project. Uh, I also like the English Standard Version, like like you said, and um, I like to look at older other older translations too, different um, Spanish translations. And I have uh, to put a plug in for the Living Bible translation here. Which okay, I enjoy yeah, for, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as with the internet, you can look up everything. You know, you can you can read um, Jerome's original Latin Vulgate, That's and right. uh, and and if you you can look at Greek manuscripts with uh, word for word translations. Um, there's a, a another interesting paraphrase coming out on um, uh, little by little called the Mirror Bible, which is you know these paraphrases can be helpful to, because they're, you're reading someone else's insight into the Bible, and and that can be useful sometimes. Yes. Now. Uh, I had a Muslim friend. He said, uh, the reason we can't accept the Bible like you Christians is because there are so many different translations. How do you know which one's the right one? We who read the Quran said we only have this one translation. Well, maybe the different, some of the different translations actually enrich the meaning of the words we find in the Bible. I think the important thing is to go back to that original question we asked at the beginning of this segment. If you only had one book to choose to read for the rest of your life, what book would that be? Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed to our channel as yet, we'd like to invite you to do that right now. And we look forward to seeing you next time.